I'm super excited to be here um, at the first Refactor conference um, that's been created for us by Angel Banks and Beth and, uh, oh God, I always forget my name, uh, but I'm super excited. Um, and my talk today is something that I feel uh, super passionate about, and I hope by the end of it, it's something that you all will also feel very strongly about and be interested in uh, doing for yourselves. Um, I'll be talking about creating a culture of quality at software and tech companies based on my experience doing that at a previous job. Um, I always take notes and do a little bit of live tweeting when I'm in the audience, so feel free to do the same if that's something you like. Um, and there's probably also time for Q&A at the end if you want to stick around before lunch, um, so I'm also open for that as well. Uh, if you do want to tweet, my handle is my name with an underscore at the end, so just Angela Riggs underscore. And I'm a quality assurance engineer in Portland, Oregon. Probably like some people here, my path into tech was not all that linear. I started out teaching um, early childhood education in Portland, Oregon. And it was a really good job and I got a lot of joy from it, but I also got to a point where I was pretty burned out. Um, I started looking into different career trajectories and ended up doing a JavaScript bootcamp in 2015. After the bootcamp, I was hired at a Drupal agency as a dev intern and then got hired on as a QA engineer at the same company. And the QA role was originally intended to be temporary, um, but it turned out that I was really good at it and I really liked it. Um, four years later, and I still love it, I get to solve interesting challenges and I get to learn new things all the time. One of the things I've learned is that many people think of quality as something that happens at a single point in the software life cycle, usually right before you end up going to production. But we all know, or we're all learning, that there are opportunities for quality at every step of the process. And that sounds great, right? Who wouldn't want more quality in their work? But what does that actually look like as we're doing our day-to-day -day jobs? The topic of quality often comes up in software, but it might mean different things to different people. So when I talk about quality, I think of quality as a mindset and as a culture that the entire company should support and be an active part of. Quality is how you get work done. It's how you communicate and how you collaborate with each other. Quality is understanding the perspective of other departments. It's engineers who understand business needs and stakeholders who understand how tech debt affects their product. It's a shift left mindset, including your designers, your testers, your sec ops in the conversation and decisions as early as possible. It's taking accountability for the work you're doing and how you're doing it. It's finding the tools and processes that work for your needs, but also being able to iterate on those processes when they don't work anymore. At its core, quality is the ability to take pride in your work because you're confident that it was the best work you knew how to do at the time. This way of thinking about quality comes from that first job as a QA engineer. When I started, the idea of quality was synonymous with the role of QA engineer. Quality was something that a couple people did sometimes on some of the projects, usually depending on the current levels of risk or how much it was on fire at the time. So when I was hired as a QA engineer, that's what I did too. And it felt terrible. We had bugs in production, there was no sense of pride in our work, and developers were siloed and burning out. It was super stressful, and I knew we needed a better way, so I started thinking about how we could change things at the company. I worked with our engineering management to figure out how we could redefine what quality looked like at our company, and how quality fit in with the way we wanted to work. We even created a set of quarterly and yearly OKRs with goals for quality, which meant the entire engineering department was a part of this process. Over a two-year period, we worked across teams and departments, advocating for standards, figuring out what people needed, all with the intent of building in that mindset of quality at every step. 
and we were successful. When I left that job, there really was a company-wide culture of quality. That culture helped inform the way everybody worked together and was an indicator of how we felt about ourselves as a company. We went from, this is fine, to high-performing engineering teams that consistently shipped good work on time, under budget. That experience shaped how I view my job as a tester and how I think quality should be considered at software companies. Those experiences also led to the creation of this talk in the hopes of inspiring other people in software and tech that a culture of quality is possible. The talk today has three parts. I'll start with some of the challenges we ran into while creating this culture and some of the ways that we solved them. I'll go into more detail around what a culture of quality can actually look like in practice, and then I'll talk about why this culture is beneficial, why it's actually worth the effort that you put into creating it. So let's get started with how to create it. Anytime you implement change, no matter how big or how small, you're going to have some challenges. During this culture shift, effective change management was the main challenge we needed to plan for. To start creating our culture shift with good change management in mind, I focused on working with the individual engineering teams rather than starting at the top with executives and directors. The executive support is necessary, but being able to shift to a quality of culture had to be supported and gain momentum from the bottom up in order to really succeed. So the challenge with change is, change is just really hard for people. Change is also really emotional. When people are faced with change, especially unexpected change or change that someone else is creating for them, they often experience what's called an amygdala hijack. This is more commonly referred to as the fight or flight response. In order to help mitigate that response, it helps to know why people are having that response in the first place. I came across the biceps model in a blog post a while back, and it was super helpful for breaking down the emotions that are behind the amygdala hijack. The biceps model describes the core needs that people have for feeling safe, which are belonging, improvement, choice, equity or equality, predictability, and significance. Understanding these needs helps me understand why change is often perceived as a threat to those needs. People like to have a sense of belonging, to feel like they're a part of something. We want to feel like people get us, and we want to know that our needs are being taken care of. Change makes us worry that our needs won't be understood or won't be taken into account when change comes along, and we're afraid that change will cause us to lose out or be left out of something. Generally speaking, people don't really like to feel stagnant. We like to know that we're able to set goals for personal and professional improvement and that we'll be supported to meet those goals. Change has the potential to introduce setbacks. Sometimes we're afraid that change will make us set goals that we don't agree with or that we don't think we can meet, or we're afraid that the change will distract us from the work we're doing to meet those goals. This is a big one. People want choices. We like options. We want to know that we have ownership over our environment and our working conditions, and that we have a say when those things change. Change makes us feel like we have less control. We're afraid that we won't have a voice in the decisions that are being made, or that the decision someone else makes will be bad for us. We hear all about fairness growing up. Your sister got five marshmallows, so you get five marshmallows. At a very basic level, that's equality. People get treated the same. As adults in the workplace, we want to feel that we're given the same opportunities and access to information as everyone else. Equity builds on the idea of equality, but it has some important differences. Equity is giving people what they need to be successful, even if that means different people get different things. When change comes along, People worry that the balance of equity will shift and they'll be worse off than they were before. Some people worry that the burden of change will be unfair and they'll have to support other people without being supported in turn. Predictability. We like the comfort of knowing our routines. 
We like being able to prepare in advance. Think of how you'd feel if 10 people dropped by unannounced for dinner. You'd panic. There are dishes piled up in the sink, you do not have enough seating for everyone, and you definitely don't have anything for your vegan friend to eat for dinner. Change, even positive change, is uncomfortable and disruptive to our daily work. It also makes us worry that we won't be prepared for things that the change introduces, like new goals or new expectations. And people like to feel valued. We like to know that the work we do, the effort we put in, contributes to the company or the people around us in some way. And we take pride in being recognized for the work that we do. We also think about our title or role that we're in currently and how we want to continue gaining status by the work that we do. When change happens, we worry about a loss in current status or recognition or that our work won't be valued in the same way anymore. Why does all this matter? Well, a culture shift introduces a lot of change. We were bringing in new workflows, new tools, a new way of looking at the work. In order to effectively manage all of these changes, we had to take these core needs into account. We needed to make sure our changes weren't a threat to people's needs, and we also needed to make sure we proved that to everyone through our actions. Thinking of people's need for predictability, make sure any changes include transition periods so your, cha your teams have time to adjust to them. Most of our process and tool changes started on a single team or project, which allowed us to find and solve blockers early stages with shorter feedback loops. Those feedback loops are really important. Feedback helps you make sure that the changes you're making will meet the needs of the people you're expecting to change. Proactively asking for feedback also lets your team know that you're not just throwing the change over a wall and running away. You're in this with them and their voices matter. These come back to the core needs of significance and choice. People need to know that their expertise and their opinions are valued and important to the process of creating this new culture. Ask for their input when you're still in the planning stage. Get their feedback when changes are being rolled out. Make time to listen to their suggestions or pain points afterwards. It's like writing an essay. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them, tell them what you told them. When you're talking with your team, it's also important to include the why. There's usually a few layers of why behind something, and including them in the conversation helps make sure you're finding the right solutions for the right problems. Things like, why do we do it this way? Why is this a pain point? Why should we change it? Why hasn't it been changed before now? And why will this iteration make it better? Talking about the why adds context and helps everyone understand what you're trying to solve with this culture change. This calls back to belonging, making sure people feel understood, making sure their needs are being considered during these changes. Good communication is also super important for successful change. People like being kept in the loop, and well-informed people can make better decisions. This relates to our need for equity, making sure people know they're not being left out, and giving them transparent access to information. When your teams are involved in the conversations, they're also more invested in the decisions that are getting made. That means they'll be an active part of the culture shift, which increases your likelihood for succeeding. Empathy is also a crucial part of successful change management. You need to understand how your team will have to adjust their habits or their skill sets. Think ahead about potential blockers or trouble areas so you can try to plan for them. Be patient. This is a process that takes time. It took us two years to finish doing this at my company. Finally, be open to iterating if something isn't working out. Sometimes you need to change your changes. Remember, change is hard and change is emotional. You're trying to create a culture of quality that everyone supports, but that culture also has to support everyone who's a part of it. During all of these changes, we also had to consider onboarding, which is closely tied with change management. Onboarding can be really difficult to execute well. 
I'm sure we've all run into this when we started a new job. And although onboarding usually refers to ramping up new employees to the company, I'm using onboarding to talk about ramping up existing teams to new tools and workflows. It's a different context, but it's a lot of the same challenges. So what exactly is onboarding in this context? Onboarding includes making sure people know what they need to know, when they need to know it, knowing who to ask when there's a question, and knowing where their information is stored. When you're onboarding your team to new workflows and new tools, you also have to balance the time and effort of that with their existing responsibilities. So as much as you can, try to make onboarding a simpler process for your teams. If you can reduce the churn and uncertainty that go along with messy onboarding, it'll be easier for them to focus on the actual work and the changes that are happening. To help with onboarding, I practiced I do, we do, you do when I introduced the teams to different types of testing. I learned this practice when I was a teacher and it works just as well for adults as it does for fifth graders. Start by doing a demo for your team. Run through the setup, write and execute a test. Then let one of the developers on your team guide you through writing another test or let them guide while someone else on the team drives. This practice helps you make sure your team can understand and use their tools effectively before you hand it over for them to continue on their own. But handing it over doesn't mean you throw it over to them and never come back to it. Make sure you check in with the team and be available for troubleshooting and feedback. People are hesitant to speak up when there's an issue, so it's up to you to work with your team to make sure things are going smoothly. If things aren't going well, take the time to understand what the blocker is and find out what they need in order for it to work. Documentation is another way to make onboarding easier for people. Everyone agrees that documentation is a great thing to have, but everyone also thinks someone else should write it. So beginning a source of documentation is a great way to ease your team into the habit. I started by creating test readmes for any of the test suites that we added to projects. I also like the practice of adding in useful bits of tool docs to those readmes so the team has easy access to the information all in one place. If you're introducing new testing frameworks, a make file is a great way to reduce the toil for your team. During our culture shift, one of the engineering teams was removing part of their code base from a larger monolith repo into a separate service, something I'm sure a lot of people are struggling with or have succeeded in. Um, so one of the things we did is we set them up on end-to-end -end testing to make sure there was no loss of functionality. Because of the different customizations and testing requirements, this is what the command ended up looking like, which is so terrible. This command makes it really hard for developers to do continuous testing. Imagine how easy it was for the test to fail because you forgot to either kill Selenium or start it again at the end or you typoed something. When you have a make file, this command ends up looking like this. Much easier for developers to use, which meant they would actually use it. For testing frameworks we used consistently, I also created template repos that could easily be copied over to new projects. Each of these templates included a readme, a makefile, and any configuration files. Everything they needed for a quick start to get up and running. Because we were able to improve the process of onboarding for our teams, they had much less resistance to trying out new things. When you can lower the barrier of use with efficient onboarding, your team will be much quicker to adopt new tools and processes into their workflow. So let's recap the lessons from creating these department-wide changes in a way that worked for everyone. Understand the BICEP's core needs, belonging, improvement, choice, equity, predictability, significance. Understand what these mean for people. Bring your empathy into play. Adjust your plans and process as needed in order to meet their needs. Communicate a lot. It builds trust. Trust in you, trust in the process, trust in the changes you're asking them to make. Seek out feedback. Make sure people's voices are heard and taken into consideration. Don't assume your changes will work 100% the first time. Listen to your teams and be willing to iterate. 
Remember that change is a collaborative effort. You're working with all of these people. Your success in creating a culture of quality is partly dependent on them. And finally, simplify where you can. Reduce churn, try to introduce the change in a way that's manageable for everyone. So I know that was a lot of information to take in. I'm gonna give everyone a quick brain break. Maybe write down any questions you wanna ask at the end or just enjoy this puppy gift for a minute. long one. Okay, so let's say you've tackled your change management. Everyone's needs are still being met. Everyone agrees that... Yeah, Sorry. Um, I just wanted to know if you can show the slides afterwards. Yes, I'll have a link at the end so everyone can look at them. Um, everyone's needs are being met by your changes. Everyone agrees that the changes are useful and working for them. What does this culture of quality end up looking like? How are people actually doing this in their day-to-day -day work? The important thing to remember is this. No single tool, test, or person can guarantee quality. In order to be truly effective, everyone needs to support and contribute to it. Everyone needs to contribute. Like, everyone, everyone? Yes, we had management, sales, PMs, architects, developers, and testers, all involved in focusing on quality and helping change our company culture. Quality is the responsibility of everyone who interacts with or makes decisions about your product. To start with, your culture of quality needs buy-in from management. This culture won't be created top-down, but the management does have to support the work going into it. Management can influence the conversations around change, and their support gives you a certain authority and credibility to the rest of the company. Management is also in charge of the money. So if you're trying out new tools or trainings as part of this culture of quality, they can give you the budget approval for that, which is pretty nice to have. Your sales team is also a part of this culture. Sales is in a perfect position to see to the ground early for conversations about quality. At our company, I partnered with our sales team to develop collateral on the process and benefits of quality. The sales team used that information when they responded to proposals, when they reached out to prospective customers, and even included it in contracts. Including the topic of quality in their process meant that our clients at least had a basic introduction to the idea of quality and its involvement in our development process. If your company does discoveries or architecture phases before a project kicks off, this is another chance to enhance your culture of quality. Architects take a long view of the work. They're trying to match up current state with future needs and make sure the work can safely scale. During discoveries, architects can start thinking about high-level testing needs and make recommendations for project architecture that will allow for easier testing down the road. The architect role can also act as a communication bridge and make sure your product managers, developers, and testers all understand the general outline of work that's getting planned out. Product managers also play a part in a culture of quality. Because of their relationship with your stakeholders, product managers can advocate for the benefits of including quality practices throughout a project. If a stakeholder doesn't hear about the importance of quality until the project has already started, they'll feel like paying for quality means sacrificing their MVP. Product managers can tell the stakeholder why quality is worth the team's time and why it's worth paying for. Developers definitely contribute to a, a culture of quality. When it comes to building the product, I know test-driven development isn't always possible. Timelines might be short, or maybe there's a lot of legacy code. However, TDD can always be supported by developers, and setting goals to increase coverage with each pull request is a great way to encourage it. Developers can also contribute through code reviews. When developers are reviewing each other's work, it means more people are familiar with what's being built. This helps decrease the chance of silos happening, 
where a single developer is responsible for part of the product and can never hand it off for help or collaborating. Ideally, code reviews offer a way for developers to communicate with each other, to ask questions and learn from someone else's work, or to share ideas around other solutions. It prompts a conversation around quality and how the work someone is doing contributes to those standards. When we were creating this culture of quality, we found that it was really helpful for teams to have a dedicated embedded tester. If a developer is immersed in the work they're doing, it's easy to take on a ground level view of the project. Having a tester on the team offers a chance for a higher level view, seeing the whole forest instead of just a few trees. A dedicated tester also means there's someone to focus on other opportunities for quality, integration or regression testing, increasing automation, and creating best practices for release management. These roles and responsibilities are some of the ways that we practiced our culture of quality, but it's not the only way for that culture to exist. If you have a site reliability or a DevOps team, a design team, a security team, they all share in the responsibility of contributing to a, a culture of quality. Ultimately, a great culture of quality is flexible with the ability to meet changing requirements. Before I get into the benefits of this culture of quality, please enjoy a basket of corgis while we give ourselves a quick break. Maybe stretch your back, stretch your hand if you're taking notes, and we'll get started again in just a sec. Okay, so we've talked about what your culture of quality might look like in practice for the people in that, that you work with, and now you're familiar with some of the challenges that come along with making change. But why have a culture of quality at all? As you're thinking about what quality means for your teams and your company, make sure you're including the benefits of this culture in your conversations. When you create a culture of quality, you're creating a better way for people to work together. You're building a stronger foundation of communication and a shared understanding about the process and benefits of quality. With a culture of quality in place, you also get an increase in the actual quality of work being produced because quality is not only encouraged, it's supported by the entire development process. That increase in quality leads to increased confidence in the work you're doing, whether you're selling the project or writing the code. Beyond that, a culture of quality leads to a culture of empowerment and trust. A culture of quality means your, de your design team is empowered to build in accessibility, even if it changes the stakeholder's initial vision. It means that management trusts the engineer's expertise. And it means that people across verticals are empowered to say, let's do this right. And those decisions are trusted by everyone else. A culture of quality also leads to a culture of pride. Pride in your work because you're confident it was the best work you knew how to do at the time. Having a company culture where people are empowered and trusted to do their best work also leads to a culture of morale. Morale is a vital aspect of any company. Good morale within a company gives teams a sense of purpose, working together toward common goals. Morale speaks to the level of psychological safety, which is also really important. Psychological safety means that people feel safe trying new things because mistakes aren't punished. It means people feel comfortable saying, I don't know, because they know they'll be offered opportunities to learn. And morale generally means that people are happy and confident coming to work. Now, you might be wondering why I'm taking a bit of a deep dive into morale. This is a talk about quality, right? Well, it is. Morale is important to quality because morale is a quality indicator. Improved morale is a result of creating this new culture. But once it exists, morale becomes a strong part of what allows this culture to thrive. When people and teams have high morale, they feel good about the work they're doing and they're more engaged in the work. 
They're willing to take chances and innovate. And they have better relationships with their teammates. In other words, the benefits of morale reinforce the benefits we get from creating a culture of quality in the first place. People working together with a shared goal of improving quality, teams that enjoy coming to work and solving problems together, and a company that is able to have confidence in the work it produces for stakeholders and clients. At the core of it all, a culture of quality enhances your ability to build and launch high quality products that meet your stakeholders' needs. And that is a culture that benefits everyone. Thank you. Um, if you want to see the slides later, you can go to this link. Um, it's up on speaker deck, and they are all up there for everybody. Um, and I also included some of the resources that I used both for this talk and for the time when I was actually creating the culture of quality um, at my job. And if you have any questions, I'm happy to field those as well. Hi, and hi. <laughs> and thank you, that was really interesting. Um, I was wondering what do you, what you can do, me, for example, I'm, I'm a developer, mm -hmm. so what can I do when I feel that the other sides of the company are not as engaged with a culture of quality as, as I think I, I may be? Um, so the question was, as a developer, what can you do um, when people in other departments or other teams aren't as engaged in a culture of quality? Um, and I think one of the things you can do is find an advocate. Um, ideally, find a manager or an exec or someone who's a point person um, within that department or team that can help advocate the message that you're trying to send about creating a culture of quality. Um, it doesn't have to be a whole department. It doesn't have to be a whole team. But if you can find other people that are well-regarded and whose voices are heard and listened to, um, that is a really great way to help make the case for this. Thank you. Uh, yeah. um, as someone else who's also in QA, did you have something QA specific that would help out, um, like I guess, the rest of the team as far as quality goes? Um, so the question was, as a QA engineer or a tester, what can you do to help out um, this, like getting other people on your team on board. Um, for that, the biggest thing is just doing the work and seeing the results. Um, it's, you know, depending on how much pressure is coming from stakeholders or clients, it's hard to say like, hey, let's change the way we work. And that means like features are gonna be coming out a little bit slower for a while. Um, but if you can say, hey, in three sprints, let's plan to try this out. Um, and put it on the schedule, make sure people like know that it's coming and make sure your product managers know that they might have you know, a reduced sprint. Um, and then say, hey, how did that go? Um, and if it works well, then you have like a little more leverage the next time you wanna try something new. And everyone else? Yeah. I'm on the product side of the house. Uh, so one of the debates I would say is probably the definition of quality. Do you have a definition of quality that you use internally? Um, not so. Not really a single definition. It was kind of just all the things. Right? Like quality means like are you confident in the work you're doing? Right. It's not like it's not a bug count. It's not like whatever tools you're using. I think bug count gets used a lot because it's an easy metric to look at, and then you can be like, look, we reduced our bugs. We're doing things. Um, but like bug prevention, it's harder to measure, but like it's, I think it's actually a really useful way to say like how many things did we prevent from getting production at all? Um, or like how many, looking at whether your, the thing that you're building actually meets the requirements of the client that you're building it for. Like that is quality. Like yes, it's like, of course we're building the thing that we're supposed to build. Um, but that is a measure of quality. It's like, are you finding the right solutions for the people that you're doing this for? The thing I'm trying to figure out how to convey is more than just number of defects. Or we might have released three defects, but the trade-off would have been the customers might have been out of compliance. At least we were able to solve yeah. the compliance issue. I might have introduced a couple of low-grade <coughs> defects to get it out. Yeah, I think just like keeping track of the wins is a really good way to. Yeah. Anyone else? Once. Twice. Lunchtime. Thank you guys. Thank you for coming to the talk.